You're listening to the Home Ownership Podcast by Movementum Realty, real estate talk for buying, selling, and owning property. Hey guys, Sean Patrick Maloney here, broker owner of Movementum Realty, located in Hanover, Massachusetts. Welcome to episode 14, a lawn care guide for homeowners. I'm your host, Sean Patrick Maloney. Thanks for joining me this week. Some of you know, some of you may not know, I actually owned a tree and landscape company before I did real estate and was very knowledgeable in tree and landscape, so I'm going to share a little bit of that knowledge today with the homeowners out there, whether you just bought your home or you've been living there for a long time. This guide should help you out a little bit with better understanding what to do with your grass, your shrubs, your trees, and your flowers. So I'm going to start on the grass. It's one of the most common things people want to take care of at this time of the year. Grass comes out of the winter and it's not looking that great and everybody wants to spruce it up. One of the first things I want to touch on is seeding a lawn. So seeding a lawn is kind of complex and kind of easy. you got two times of the year to do it. One is spring, the other one is fall. Reason being is the moisture is around at that time of the year and it's easiest for the grass to grow when the temperatures are in the 50s and 60s versus the middle of the hot summer. A lot of times it doesn't have time to root, it doesn't go deep enough roots, and it gets burnt if you try to do it in the midsummer. When you're doing the seeding in the springtime, it's important to think about one thing. If you're going to be using a Scott's or anyone else's multi-step program, you have to skip over step one and step two when you're going to be seeding. Step one, the grass fertilizer that they use in Scott's, it actually has a seed inhibitor, so it actually stops seeds from growing. It's called a pre-emergent. So if you're going to put a pre-emergent down, it's actually going to kill the seed you put down at the same time. So you want to grab what they call a triple 19 or just a straight fertilizer and put it down at the same time as seeding. So a lot of people ask me when I talk about seeding, well, what's the best method of seeding, overseeding, whatever type of seeding you want to call it? One of the best methods would be slice seeding. It's a little more expensive than the typical seeding, but slice seeding actually cuts little harrow lines into the ground and it drops the seeds in, giving them a little protection. But there's a couple other methods that you can use. One would be the easiest is just put it in the spreader, grab a bag of seed and spread it around. That's going to give you just, you know, a little filler and put in a little more actual grass on your lawn. That's the one that's just kind of starting to thin out. The next version down would be to aerate and seed. Aeration is great because it actually breaks up the compaction of the soil. It allows the water better penetration down into the soil. It creates holes that the seed falls down into and gets protected, as well as just like your gut where you have a microbiome, where you have living organisms in there, the ground has living organisms. And so when you flip the soil through aeration, it rearranges where the microbes are. And a lot of those microbes actually, they have a very important role in the lawn. They actually eat the thatch layer, which is the dead grass that's down at the bottom. And they end up dead over time because of traction, people driving over the lawn, right on lawn mowers, lawn chemicals, all those things. So by flipping the soil, we, again, with the aeration, we allow less compaction, we redo the microbiome, we end up allowing the water to penetrate better and give the place for the seeds to hide. The other option is to dethatch and seed. Dethatching is when you take, and you can do it with anything from a rake to an actual dethatcher machine, it's where you hard rake it and you pull all the dead grass out from the bottom. What this does is allows the soil to touch the seed. Because one thing that a lot of people don't realize, but when the soil touches the seed and the, they actually are together, it allows the seed to germinate better and the root get right into the ground. Sometimes when you don't dethatch and the seed sits up above the soil layer, it dries out faster because it's basically up in the air and the wind can come around it and dry the seed out. So... One of the things to think about when you're seeding is you never want that seed to get dry. The way I used to explain it to my clients all the time was, think about a baby. Can you give a baby twice as much water tomorrow because you didn't give them water yesterday? And the answer is no, the baby is already dead. And if you don't water seed, but you give it twice as much water the next day, it's already dead. Inside the seed, this is actually something called a germ. And that germ, you only get a single one of. Think about it just like an embryo. So if you don't take care of that germ, once you've actually watered it and livened it up, it now is going to die and it won't come back. And that's why sometimes you'll see lawns that don't come in nice, but there's still seed everywhere. And I used to get that all the time from clients. Well, there's still seed everywhere. Well, guess what? If there's not seed there that's alive. It's a bunch of dead seed. We need to get some new seed there. So remember, during the process for watering seeding, it's constantly a moist surface layer until the seed gets to the point where you see the little green hairs 
of grass. Now you need to start watering a little deeper because it's now connected to the ground. So at first you're watering all the time, then it's connected to the ground. You're watering maybe two to three times a day, but deeper. And then as it continues along, you want to start moving your watering to only the morning time so that the water doesn't stay on the grass during the nighttime and end up creating mold or fungus or any of the other issues that can come with it. So when we talked at first, we were talking about the multi-step system. Again, you want to skip one and two during the process of seeding. You cannot put step two down, which is going to be, step two is the lawn weed control where it actually kills the weeds out of the grass. You can't put that one down till you've mowed your new grass four times. So once you hit a height, which is three and a half inches, and you start cutting the grass, you can now put down step two. So once you've mowed it your fourth time, you're now ready for step two. So let's move on to the multi-step program. One of the guides that I used to not really understand myself is nothing in the nature world has to do with what month it is or any of these things that we think of. What it has to do with is soil temperature. So the soil temperature and the light change from the environment, meaning the sun coming up at different times and being in a different place in the azimuth, means that the plants actually react to those things. So one of the best guides to figuring out when to start your multi-step program, when to put down step one, which would be your crabgrass preventer if you're not going to be seeding, is when you see the Fasithia bloom. So the Fasithia bush is the yellow bush that you see early, early springtime. When that blooms, that means the soil temperature is approximately 50 to 55 degrees, which is the same time where crabgrass and all these other weed seeds will actually germinate. So when that temperature hits that, which makes the Fasithia bloom, you know it's time to put down your step one. And then all the other steps, depending on whether you're doing a four step or a six step, they're going to tell you how many weeks between the two. Don't overdo it, but don't underdo it. Make sure you follow it. The key to good grass is water, feed, and mowing. And so a question that came up to me recently was, when I mow my lawn, am I better to cast the grass out or am I better to catch the grass and put it away? The question is on that one, are you using an organic program or are you using a multi-step synthetic fertilizer program? If, if you're using synthetic fertilizers, you don't want to let the grass go. You want to catch the grass and put it away take it off the lawn and maybe put it in the compost pile or take it off and just throw it away, whatever you need to do, depending on where your house is. If you're using an organic fertilizer, you want to cast those grass clippings right back down on the lawn and let them break up. Remember when you're doing this and not using a bagger, it means you need to mow a little more often. You don't want to be casting out four or five inches worth of grass. You want to be mowing it probably once to twice a week, depending on how fast your grass is growing. And the reason for this is with synthetic fertilizers, it grows the grass so quickly and so much different than it normally grows in the environment that it doesn't break down at time and can create a really thick thatch layer. Whereas when you're using an organic one, you do not want to take those elements and nutrients away from the lawn. You want to cast them back out so that they break down. So those are the organic ones a lot of times you use in chicken manure and other things like this. They're not nearly as powerful as the synthetics. You're not going to have as nice of a lawn, but it may be what you want to do for the environment. It may be how you feel for your children. Um, I can tell you if you go to parks and everything, they're all using synthetics. So if you think you're not going to have exposure to synthetics, you probably are in inadvertently, whether you go to commercial buildings or parks or any of these other places, they're all using them. Ultimately, the best lawn, like I said before, though, is regular mowing, regular fertilization, and watering all the time. If you let it go, you're going to lose out. Either one, Any one of those steps is going to lose it out. I'll just quickly go over the importance of mowing. When you're mowing your lawn, you're going to cut off the top tips. So just like if you think about the cuticle on your fingernail, the grass has what's called a crown. So if the crown of the grass is allowed to grow up too high, the grass does what you call tufting, which is where you kind of see little individual groupings of grass, but there's no grass in between. So each and every time we cut the tip of the grass off, it makes it go outside through what they call tillers. These little tillers reach out to the side and continue to spread the grass plant. Because a grass plant isn't just like a single string, it'll get wider and wider. So by mowing more often, you actually end up with a thicker lawn. By mowing less often, you risk cutting that thing that I just mentioned, the cuticle, also known as the crown. If you cut the crown, it's just like when you cut the cuticle. You can actually kill your nail by cutting it too low. Same thing will happen with the grass. So just think you really want to mow on the regular to make sure you have a nice thick lawn. So let's move on to the trees and shrubs. The trees and shrubs is a real common question for me of what to do with them. So first and foremost, you always want to feed them annually. Feeding them or fertilizing them, we call them, we sometimes call each one the same thing, but it is truly fertilizing them. They do actually not eat the fertilizer. They use the fertilizer in the process of 
creating what you call photosynthesis and they end up eating the material that they photosynthesize and they don't actually eat the fertilizer. So the word feeding them isn't exactly correct, but we can use that one for now. So spring or fall, fertilization is always preferred. That way there the plant has a lot of time to take it up with the water and not the dry heat during the summertime. It can burn the plant if it doesn't have enough water around during the time that you fertilize it. So make sure you do that in the early season. And when you do fertilize it, you might want to put a sprinkler underneath the tree or bush for a little bit and get it wet so that it has the ability to take in all the fertilizer you put down. Remember that trees and shrubs don't want water on their leaves. You only water the plant at its base. You don't water the trunk. You don't water the leaves. If you do, it can cause fungus. So that's something important to always keep in mind when working on plants. No plant drinks through its leaves. Even the desert plants, a lot of people say, oh, I completely submerge my cacti and things. They don't really want that. And a lot of times the reason they don't want that is the water that you're putting on them is bad. And what I mean by bad is normally in its normal environment, a plant wouldn't be exposed to things like bleach and other chemicals that are found like fluoride as well in our water. So they don't actually like it on their leaves. And it's not like rainwater. Rainwater has all sorts of natural things, living organisms in it and everything. And they end up being okay with that. But when we put the street water on there, it really hurts the plant. So just think always at the base and that'll help out. The next thing to talk about is pruning. So when to prune, we'll go over. We won't go over to how to prune because that could be a whole guide in and of itself. But when to prune. So any plant that you see, once it goes through its flowering stage, it's now time to prune. So lilacs and all these things, a lot of people will prune them in the fall. And then they wonder why they don't have any flowers. Well, you want to prune them right after they flower. If you prune them right after they flower, so basically think of it like this. The flowers are great. They're looking awesome. You're enjoying them. Now they're starting to die out and they're starting to gray up and they're starting to lose their petals. That's the exact time you want to prune. It's the time the plant wants to be pruned. It's the time that you want to prune to have maximum buds for next year. So just after the flowers fall off, what pushes them off the end is going to be your next year's blooms. So what that means is if you decide to prune them too late, you'll take all your blooms off. When you're pruning, all people currently, they kind of seem to think that the only way to prune things is to use hedge trimmers. You're better off to grab hand pruners just because of the fact that you're not going to cut all the tips off. You're going to reach in and cut different branches out and trim properly. Again, we'll go over the full pruning guide some other time, but just make sure you do that because you're going to maximize your flowers. If you're always hedge trimming, you're not going to end up with nearly as many flowers and the plants can end up too dense and it's going to end up with issues. And then the last but not least, let's talk about treating them. Spraying them or putting it in systemically, they call it, which is putting in the soil and having the plant pull it up through its root system. Both of them are effective. A lot of people that are like the bees don't really like the systemics because the systemics end up making the pollen uh, have the chemical within it. So just keep that in mind when you're going to use the systemic types. Things that you want to look at at this time of the year, the worst one we have currently is called the winter moth. The winter moth is that little moth that you see flying around in November and December around the headlights of your car. When you're driving down the road, it's also that same little green caterpillar that you see eating the trees. So the winter moth caterpillar actually, during the season when you see that moth flying around, that's mating season and they're actually going along on your trees and laying eggs in the bark. So the eggs are there all the way from winter time and in springtime they hatch. By the time you see the damage done to your tree, it's already done. You actually want to treat the tree at what they call bud emergence, which is when the bud is opening up. Just before that, you can treat the tree. If you think when you're a little kid and you're going to make a snowflake out of a piece of paper, you cut it when it's folded and it makes a lot of holes. So now if you think that little teeny tiny worm, if he goes into that bud before it opens and it eats little holes, it means that one hole may be eight holes. So by the time the leaf opens, it looks like massive damage for a little tiny guy. And that's because he had a folded up target and it eats its way through. So you want to take care of those ahead of time and spray your trees or treat your trees. That way there you're not dealing with them. Especially some of their favorites would be maples. So Japanese maples, sugar maples, and Norway maples, and all the rest of the maple trees that you have out there, as well as oak trees. They get heavy damage. If a tree defoliates completely, meaning losing all its foliage, it does have a starch storage within itself that allows it to regrow another set of leaves. But making a tree go through the process of doing two sets of leaves more than one year in a row can actually kill the tree. And you'll notice a lot of dead branches even when it does do that because it needs to figure out how am I going to compartmentalize the damage that I have and how am I going to shut off certain things. So the tree shuts off certain parts of itself and that way there it protects itself. So just think, always treat your trees ahead of time. 
And the best way to deal with it is honestly to hire a professional. On tree spraying and everything, a lot of times the tree's too tall for you to actually spray. If you have some little ornamentals and stuff, it's easy enough. But I would I would suggest hiring out for this one. You can reach out to a local tree care company. Usually the difference between tree removal and tree care is evident in the name. So take a look at ones that call themselves tree care companies. A tree removal company probably won't know what they're doing when it comes to taking care of a tree. The tree care companies specialize in that. So last but not least, let's just talk real quick about flowers and installation and feeding them and treating them. So if you want really good flowers, if you have a driven by somebody's house that has really good flowers, they're constantly feeding their flowers. And again, we'll use the word feed versus fertilize. I prefer organics on this. I usually prefer synthetics on everything else. But flowers and gardens seem to do the best with organics. So I use one called Neptune's Harvest. I think it's a really good fertilizer. You put that down on the regular, and this is the one time where we're going to break the rule. We're actually going to water the flower the actual leaves and the, everything like that. And the reason being is the plant will actually suck in the organic fertilizers. Don't do this with synthetics, but it'll suck in the organic fertilizers through its leaves and through its stem and everything like that. So let's make sure we give them a good dose. And, and on that, you read the instructions based on the actual fertilizer you're using. And remember, look at each plant differently. So your geraniums are going to love a high acid. They're going to love a high acid fertilizer. But if you put that same fertilizer on some other plants, they're not going to be just as happy. So you want to take a look at each and every plant you have and feed accordingly. So, you know, there is no one size fits all. And the one size fits all that everyone always talks about is miracle Grow. miracle Grow is actually usually terrible when it comes to flowers or food. Do you really want to eat some blue powder for dinner? And that's what you're doing. I mean, it's making this huge looking vegetable. But when you eat the vegetable, you'll notice that it just tastes like water. And it's because of the type of growth that the miracle grow makes the plant go through, which we always refer to it in the industry as adventitious growth versus good growth. And that can lead to less tasty vegetables as well as your flowers and stuff not doing as well. And one thing that loves adventitious growth are bugs. So bugs can attack that because during the time where a plant grows, at a certain point it does what's called hardening off. At the point where it hardens off, the, the bugs don't really get the exposure to be able to eat it as well. Um, and then if you do it, with the miracle grow, it grows so quickly that it doesn't harden off in time, and it ends up with getting bugs. And one of the bugs that's most common to come is the aphids. They love to attack flowers and eat them. So when you have nice flower beds, you want to make sure that you're feeding them on the regular, watering them on the regular. And also, when you're doing the install, you want to make sure that you're using good soil and you're adding soil to the mix so that way there your flowers aren't struggling to get water. Most flowers are pretty artificial to the area. Most of them come from the tropics and stuff. So you want to think that they like moist soil and you want to think, how do I make my soil improved from where I'm at? One of the best ways to find out where your soil's at, whether it's for your grass, yeah, your trees, your shrubs, or your flowers, is to actually take a sample and send it off. Most people don't know, but UMass Amherst out in western Massachusetts, they actually have a lab there that'll test your soil, and it's relatively inexpensive, somewhere between $25 and $50. And they'll actually test it and tell you what's wrong and what to fix. They'll actually send you back a list of the amendments to add, meaning fertilizers or any of the other things that need to be added to the soil to make it the optimal soil for your plants. And again, remember, each and every plant has a different need, so letting them know what soil comes from where and maybe sending in multiple different samples for different beds to do different purposes is going to get you the best results. The other thing they do is if you have a sick plant, you can send them in samples. Go on the website and read about it. They're actually going to ask you for cuttings. You mail them to them and they'll actually, just like a doctor, they'll give you what's wrong with the plant and then they'll tell you what to do to fix it. So when you're doing treating landscape, you always want to think to yourself, each individual plant, each individual situation calls for individual care. Your sunny part of your lawn needs more water than the shady part of your lawn. Your plants that need high acid need high acid. Other ones need base. You got to remember there is no fix-all to lawn care or landscape maintenance. The true fix-all is ultimate care, paying attention to each thing that matters, and putting in lots of time. I used to say to people, how green your lawn will be is how green your wallet is. And what I meant by it is the more money that they spent with me, the more time I could take care of their plants. And I always say, you got to think about it like a bank account. That's, you know, if you don't put money into it, it's never going to grow, right? So if you don't put money into your lawn, and money could be time, your own time, a landscaper's time, or someone else's time. But it's an investment. So the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. Have a great year this year. Hope you get out and enjoy the spring. Enjoy those flowers and send me some pictures of what you grow. If you have any questions, feel free to always email me. You can text me. You can message me. And make sure to follow the podcast. If you have any other 
ideas for future podcasts, also feel free to send them out to me. Have a great week.